Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second session for the 2019 IEEE Women in Engineering International Leadership Conference virtual track. My name is David Stankwitz, and I'm the event producer and the host for today's session. Um, today, we have an amazing presenter, Florence Liu from IBM, who's going to talk about her over 190 patent applications, um, which is just mind boggling. Um, before we get into introducing Florence and then uh, ultimately handing the reins over to her to present, I do want to let you know that it's interactive. And today's session, we want to hear from you. So you should see on the right-hand side of your screen a chat window. Um, this is a public chat, a public forum, where you can just communicate with one another um, and collaborate and ask questions. And speaking of questions, uh, the second way to participate is to use the Ask a Question button. It's at the bottom of your screen. And you can put your question in there. And you can also vote or upvote the best questions. And uh, hopefully, at the end, we get some really good ones. And Florence can address as many of those questions as she possibly can. Uh, at the end of her presentation. So before I kick things over to our speaker, uh, let me introduce Florence Liu. Florence Liu is a senior solution architect and a four-time IBM master inventor working at IBM Research in Massachusetts. She has developed different software applications at IBM and used her technical, excuse me, used her technical skills to file more than, as I mentioned, 190 patent applications for IBM in areas such as social software, Internet of Things, healthcare analytics, security, accessibility, uh, and the list goes on and on. Florence actively mentors and encourages other IBM employees to turn their ideas into patents by hosting workshops and educational seminars uh, and webinars like this one today. And she loves to inspire her colleagues as they start their careers in computing. Florence has developed smart methodology which she uses to teach invention techniques to many people from different countries all around the world. And hopefully after today's session, uh, you will be inspired by her work and uh, potentially become uh, what Florence calls herself an invention addict, which I love that term. Um, so what I'll do now, Florence, I'm gonna go ahead and um, fade into the background while you pull up your presentation, and then I'll come back on screen at the end to do the Q and A portion. So Florence, over to you. Hey everyone, this is Florence Lu speaking. Thanks so much for joining today's presentation. And uh, thanks for David for the introduction. My name is Florence Lu. I'm a senior solution architect working at IBM Research. Today is really my great pleasure to present the topic called Reinventing the World, the power of the pattern in bringing aha moment to life. First of all, I would like to go over today's agenda. We're going to talk about why do we need to patent the invention creation process? How do we know the idea is patentable? I'm going to share some of the best practices that I have collected during the past decade. I will also share some of my sample patents, and then I will explain the smart methodology I developed. At the end, I'm going to share a sample bonus slide. Of course, I will save some time towards the end to answer questions that you may have. So why do we need to patent? A patent legally protects the intellectual property rights of the inventor. I feel very fortunate to work for IBM because we have a great culture and support here to file patents. And in 2018, IBM received more than 9,000 patents that were issued by USPTO. We have been in the patenting leadership for more than 26 years. And here is the general invention creation and evaluation process. So if you want to create a patent, first of all, you definitely need to identify some challenges that you have observed around you. So once you observe the challenge, you want to sit down and try to research some possible solutions. But before you write up any official document, it's very important you conduct something called a PR search. This means you want to make sure nobody has patent similar solutions Nobody has written this solution in their conference paper or blog. Nobody has developed this particular solution in their product. So once you're sure your invention solution is novel, then you can draft a document called a disclosure document. So this is the document that you create before you officially file any patent. So both individuals as well as corporations can file patents. 
And uh, for me, I work for IBM, so we have a great support and end-to-end -end process. I get to work with patent attorneys to prepare the patent application, and then they will help file the patent applications for us. A few years later, then the USPTO examiner is going to evaluate your patent application, and they will determine whether they should grant the patent or not. So this is a general invention process. When the patent examiner looks at the patent application, in general, they will look at the invention from three different aspects. First of all, they want to make sure your invention is novel. This is just as what I described a moment ago. You want to make sure nobody has patented this before and nobody has written this same solution in their conference paper or any public text or nobody has developed this particular same solution in their product. And you definitely want to make sure you invent something that is useful, which means you want to improve the process of that challenge you want to solve. You don't want to create something that is even more counterproductive. And you want to make sure your invention is not obvious. So I just want to give you a very simple example here. If somebody has already created a feature to be able to sort the file names in the Windows Explorer using the first letter in the file's name and display all these files in the ascending order by their name. And if you just want to use the same technique, but you want to actually sort the files using descending order, that will be considered as obvious. Therefore, this idea is not patentable. Now I'm going to share some of the best practices I have collected. When I started patenting more than a decade ago, I thought that I'm just going to be so brilliant. I'm going to create lots of lots of inventions. At the very beginning, I was not all that successful. I had filed several patents, but some of my inventions actually got turned down. But I was not discouraged. I was able to find myself a very, very awesome mentor. My mentor guided me through on understanding what is patentable, and my mentor also guided me through the invention creation process. Once I became more experienced, I actually started to mentor other people on patenting. I found out that it's very helpful to start with a small problem, and then we come up with a small solution, but you can always expand your solution to other domains. So that's why I call this start small, and think big. So please do yourself a favor. Before you write up any official document, please try to do some very thorough PR search before you write up the document. This way, you will save yourself lots of time and effort. And along this process, please make sure you have fun. I have been able to file more than 190 patent applications for IBM. This is because I always have fun. I keep learning new technologies and uh, I keep just growing my knowledge. This is really a fun process for me. People always ask me, Florence, where do you always get all these ideas? How can you just keep patenting? Now I'm going to share some of my sample patents here. The first one is called the public speaking self-evaluation tool. I actually really enjoy public speaking. Before I had a family, I used to go to Toastmasters club meeting in the evening. But once I have kids, I no longer have such free time. And I still need to practice my presentations from time to time. How do I do that? I decided just to create a tool to help myself. So this is the pattern I created. As you can see on this panel, this particular invention will be able to simulate the same experience you will gain once you get to those Toastmaster club meetings. This particular invention include the functionalities that actually can count how many R arms you have in your speech. It will also detect the rhythm of your speech and it will also monitor the eye contacts you have with your audience. As you can see, a simple invention will be able to help lots of people practice their speech at home. Of course, you can also adjust the rhythm for monitoring your speech. 
because sometimes when we deliver different type of presentations, you may want to be able to speak faster versus slower, depending on the intended goal or outcome of this particular speech. Once my kids are older, I started to do some volunteer works at their school. I also do STEM volunteers work at the local science festival as well. I really found that was a very rewarding experience. For example, for the very first science project I did at the local school it was called Color Changing Milk. The way this particular science project works is that you prepare some whole milk and then you dip a few drops of food coloring in the center of the milk. And then you put a drop of the dish soap in a Q-tip. And then you just need to dip the Q-tip in the center of the milk. As soon as that happens, you will see all the colors burst into different directions. It was really fun. I did that particular project in our recent Cambridge Science Festival in Massachusetts last weekend. All the kids love that particular project. And when I prepared this project at home, I had a hard time to think about how am I supposed to explain all these complex chemical reactions to a group of kindergartners. Then I realized that for children around this age, they like to play with Legos. So this is exactly how I did. I actually brought some Legos in addition to the material of this science project. I was able to explain the reaction of the project and also the concept about the chemical bond. After I got home, I was so excited about that experience because all the kids loved that project. They even wanted to hire me as their science teacher. But then I realized that IBM may not be able to file a patent just on putting some Legos together. At the same time, I realized that we were asked to upgrade our source control tools from one type of tool to another. Not everybody was happy about that tool migration because they have been using the same source control tools for more than 10 or 15 years. But if we put these tools side by side, you can see that the basic functionalities are pretty much the same. You can check in, check out your code, you can compare the code changes and things like that. So I decided to create a pattern to be able to identify the commonalities between two different domains, and then use a common metaphor to be able to link the commonality between these two domains. So that's exactly what I did. I was able to find a pattern called using metaphors to present concepts across different intellectual domains. And it was already granted. As you can see, through all these uh, STEM volunteer works, I got such a wonderful reward. Some people in the audience may be super moms like me. There's so many things that we need to juggle. We need to take care of work. We need to take care of our family. We also need to do lots of other things. However, how can we fit everything in 24 hours? For example, I need to prepare meals for my family. I want to make sure that everybody get nutritious food. At the same time, I also want to learn something along the way. So I decided to actually listen to those audiobooks. I remember once I was listening to this particular book called The Last Lecture that was written by Dr. Randy Pouch. I actually met Dr. Randy Pouch when I studied at Carnegie Mellon University. He was really an awesome educator. His story really inspired lots of students and other people as well. I was listening to this audiobook, and all of a sudden, I heard that my children were asking for help. So I ran to the living room and I helped them for whatever they needed. And then I went back to the kitchen to continue cooking. But I have to reset my audiobook to the beginning because when I was in the living room, the audiobook kept going on. After a few times, I noticed that experience was not very productive because I had to keep rewinding my audiobook. Then I realized I really have to create an invention to solve this particular challenge. So my invention was to actually determine that whether people were actually focusing on listening to the particular chapter of the audiobook. And then if their attention actually got distracted, then we'll actually slow down or pause. 
And then when the user resumes to listen to the audiobook, it can pick up where they stopped and just replay from where they stopped. As you can see, this particular invention can be used in different domains. For example, when you need to listen to your voicemail or for people who need to depend on screen reader software to do their work, they will also be able to benefit from this particular invention. So screen reader is a software that can actually read the text that are displayed on the user interface. For people who have visual impairment, they usually depend on this type of software to do their work or read other things on the screen. So if their attention actually got distracted, then if they have to start from the beginning of the page, that will not be efficient at all. As you can see from a simple little challenge I had at home, I was not able to actually continue to listen my audiobook because I got distracted. I was able to come up with an awesome invention and I was able to even expand that particular invention to different domains. Then I was able to help lots of people. Next example I want to share is called a question answer system using physical distance data. I have a very interesting story behind this as well. Sometimes people may experience some pain or other symptoms. In general, they need to go to see their family doctors. And if their family doctors cannot figure out what exactly or what's wrong with them, they, the family doctor will need to send them to see the specialist. And then they probably have to go through a certain type of tests in order to determine what exactly is the pain from. So for people who are software engineers or people who are long distance truck drivers or taxi drivers, for this type of population, they are, a little, they are at a higher risk of getting carpal tunnel syndrome, but they may not really have that particular illness. Instead, sometimes it's just that uh, they may have muscle fatigue or sometimes they may have injured themselves that they did not really realize. So this particular invention can help them because we can use a wearable device to monitor the objects they interact with on a daily basis. After collecting a set of historical data, we can actually compare the symptoms the user experiences with a centralized database that uh, collect all the different symptoms from different type of units. And then we can actually determine what's the possible cause of the user's symptom. Of course, we're not here to replace doctors. We're here to help initialize the initial evaluation of their symptoms, and then they can further get additional medical consultation as needed. The next example I want to share is called Automatic Real-Time Route Generator System. There's another interesting story behind this. I went back to China a few years ago to visit friends and family, and I needed to find a bank at a newly built financial district. I was really impressed to see all these new street maps actually have brills on them. I was very impressed the fact that, you know, now we are really having these inclusions in different parts of the world. At the same time, I realized that it was very challenging even for me to go from point A to point B in a very busy st street. And imagine that there are so many different buildings, there are several different streets people have to cross just to get to their destination. There's no way for people to memorize all the details. I even had to take a picture of that particular roadmap to remember all the directions because that was my first time to go to that place. Even though there are brails on the street map, it's going to be even more challenging for people who have visual impairments to go to visit and find their destination. So I came up with an invention that can actually download this information in both text and audio format. This way, the user can just bring all this information on their PDA and they can navigate to their destination safely. The next example I want to share is called a logical key combinations detection and alert system. 
I have a very interesting story behind this one. I remember several years ago, I needed to do a very important presentation in our Ohan's room. And uh, in front of a few hundred audiences, I think I was such in a rush and I happened to hit the wrong key combinations. So instead of project my screen, I actually made a mistake and closed the application. That was a little bit embarrassing. And I decided that I really have to come up with an invention to solve this particular challenge. So the solution I came up with was to detect the potential key combinations the user's fingers are about to press. And we definitely need to analyze the user's current contextual environment. And we want to analyze what exactly is the intention the user wants to do next. So for example, if the user is in a large conference room and he's about to project the screen, then on the PC layout, on the PC's keyboard layout, function F7 are the right key combination for the user to actually project the screen. And then if the user is about to hit Control F4 or Alt F4 to close the document or the application, then this particular invention is going to alert the user to ask them to see whether they really intend to close the document or application. As you can see, this particular invention will help lots of people as well. The next example is called fast restoration of application specific experience. This time we have, so in the new technology world, there's so many different ways people can communicate. These days we use Slack to communicate and there are other types of instant messaging applications out there as well. So imagine that you're in the middle of doing something very important. For example, you're debugging your code and all of a sudden you got distracted. And then you had to go to help somebody else on that uh, particular um, instant messaging application. And by the time when you finish helping other people, you went back to your debugging code and you may not remember where you left off. And then you have to start your debugging process all over again. This is not very efficient. So I decided to come up with a solution here. So my solution is to be able to record the user's interaction with the application on his desktop before he actually got interrupted. And then once the user resumes his work, this particular invention will be able to replace, replay the last certain minutes of his previous action. This will help user refresh his memory. This way the user can resume his work quickly. The next pattern I'm going to share is called mobile device input language suggestion based on message receivers environment. Imagine that you need to call somebody or you need to text somebody and uh, but you don't know whether there are other people around the message receiver. And um, these days there are different type of cards that can actually be linked to the user's smartphone. So imagine that uh, you text some PIN number to your family members, and then they happen to use their car's capability to read out the text they receive on their smartphone. However, there are other strangers or other people sitting in the same car. This way, they, other people will actually also hear the PIN number. That will not be very efficient. So that's why I came up with this particular invention to be able to monitor the environment the message receivers in and depending on what's the current status and also what's the information needs to be sent, the message sender will be able to get a hint to see whether the same information can be sent through a different language. This way, we definitely want to be able to keep the confidential data uh, in a safe place. So over the years, I was able to develop this smart methodology. And the term smart here stands for see, meditate, articulate, research, and tackle. This particular methodology can actually remind people to constantly observe the challenges around them. As you can see from my sample patterns, 
I've been constantly observing all these challenges around me. And then I actually sit down to think about what could be the possible solutions of the challenge. And then when I write up my Discord document, I was able to articulate what's the challenge and what's my solution. And of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, before you write up official documents, it's very important that you do very thorough research to make sure your idea is patentable. Once you're sure, then you will be able to tackle that particular challenge. And I truly believe everybody can invent. All you need is curiosity, willingness to keep learning, dedication to create impactful results, now I'm going to share a sample bonus slide, as I promised. As I mentioned, I have a family and I want to make sure that I cook very delicious and nutritious food for my family. So I even got this particular recipe through my inventions process and experience. So the ingredients of this particular recipe include beef, soy sauce, sugar, and also it will require high quality noise cancellation headphones. And the required ingredient here is a very interesting patentable idea that you want to write up along with some dedication of invention. Here how it works. So you cook the beef along with the water, soy sauce and sugar. After that, you need to put on your headphone and start researching and writing up your document. You're so focused by the time when you smell the food is burning, you have to rush to the kitchen and remove the cooking pot from the stove immediately. And just let the beef cool down. And then you can slice the beef into pieces and enjoy the beef jerky. I actually have tried this particular recipe and um, it was tasting very good. Even though at the beginning, I actually burned like two or three cooking pots already. I had to go back to the store to buy a few more cooking pots. However, I actually came up with lots of inventions along the way when I, when I was cooking for my family. So now I would like to save some time and answer any questions you may have. There, there is one question in the queue and then I, I'm taking down notes. So I have a couple questions myself I would like to ask you. Sure. Um, but uh, the first question I do want to take from the audience, and it comes from Kara. Kara asks, uh, what is the best process for a thorough prior art search? So, uh, you know, what process do you use um, to go through things thoroughly um, for, for uh, you know, your work and your patents? Yeah, sure. So for USPTO, they actually have official search engines and there are two different ways to actually search, um, you know, the existing, uh, you know, uh, filed patterns. And they have a form for simple power search as well as for advanced power search, depending on how complex your invention is. So okay. you can utilize that resource. <clears throat> um and maybe if someone's looking for those links or something, we could share them with them um, to yeah. let them know. Yeah, okay, sure, definitely. Perfect. So um, I don't see any other questions right now. So anyone who's still watching, uh, I appreciate you, uh, you know, staying for Florence's presentation. Use the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen um, to ask a question. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question, Florence, because we were talking uh, before the session as we were getting ready. Uh, mm -hmm. You're an IEEE member. <clears throat> yeah. And you're part of that community or that group um, mm -hmm. but when it comes to patents um, are there you know I was just googling a little bit are there resource groups or um, communities that you can join to be amongst like-minded individuals you know I see a patent resource group on Facebook there's mm -hmm. a patent uh, resource community on LinkedIn are, are you connected mm -hmm. in any way to you know people who are as into this as, as you are uh, actually, not really. This is because I'm an employee from IBM and uh, everything I invented here needs to be kept confidential and uh, I won't be able to share my inventions before it's filed due to legal reasons. Got it. Okay. But if somebody did want to join a group, I'm sure there's many ways out there that people, you know, somebody who's yeah. just starting out, who has a brilliant yeah. idea, 
where they can go to, um, you know, an online social media group or something like that to get involved. Yeah, I see. But uh, they do need to be a little bit careful about protecting their uh, inventions because they don't really want to disclose their invention to the public before they file their patent applications. And you know, that that sort of segues into the second question I had of you, right? So um, you sort of go from idea or concept mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you do your research and, and then that turns into a patent. <clears throat> which as we all know is, is, is really, you know, just a document certifying your invention. Yeah. But from there, are you marketing or selling your patents? Are you um, economizing them in any way? Uh, no, my name will be listed as one of the inventors on the patent application, but the company I work for actually owns the patent. And then uh, different company have different ways or different type of strategies to cross licensing their inventions or patents. I'm not really involved in any of those process. My job here is just to create inventions. Okay. And you know, that, that leads into sort of a question here, which um, Aylin, I hope I'm saying your name right, Aylin, had a question about your company, right? Is it possible yeah. to have patents in a different area than your company's area or you know, focus or field of interest? In general, for the company that uh, you know, I currently work for, we do have patent strategies that are defined by our leadership and uh, all the patents that got filed through IBM needs to be within those uh, focus area. Okay. Very good. Okay, so we're people are starting to ask questions fast and furious. So we're, I'm just going to go in the order in which I see them here. Um, so uh, Kara had another question. Um, are the majority of your patents ideas? Uh, what are the easiest things to patent? For example, is an idea or a product, uh, maybe something else? Yeah, so I would say that uh, all of these p uh, patents that I have filed, they're always inspired by, you know, some small challenge or big challenge that I've observed around me. And um, I can write some pseudocode to prove my idea are implementable. And uh, I can even potentially integrate my ideas into our products. And uh, IBM helped file those patents to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, our inventions get protected. And, uh, you know, as an employee of IBM that, uh, you know, we can file these patents. And, uh, well, I hope, you know, that answers the question. Yeah, no, I, I think it does. I, if, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, Carrie, you want to follow up um, uh, to that answer from Florence? Um, I do have, oh, hi, Jaredna. Jaredna asked a question. Um, mm -hmm. How long ago, so let's take it back to the beginning. How mm -hmm. long ago did you develop your first patent? Yeah, so I developed my first patent when I was on my uh, first maternity leave, and that was actually the patent called the uh, pa Public Speaking Self Evaluation Tool, and uh, that was more oh. than ten years ago. And I happened to actually have eight weeks staying at home for my maternity leave, and in the uh, in addition to take care of my newborn, I was able to draft a few disclosure documents. Got it. Okay. So, and we we actually saw that in the presentation. So that's the one that you had showed us. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, oh, we have another question here from Eva. Thanks, Eva. Um, she says, thank you for the overview, Florence. Um, how many people help with your patents on average? So, uh, you know, is it just mm -hmm. you or is there a group? Uh, that really depends. Sometimes I'm the only inventor on the patent and sometimes that I also mentor other people within the company on patenting. So it really depends. But uh, it's very important that um, everybody who is listed as an inventor on the patent application, everybody must have contributed at least one claim on the patent application in order to be qualified as an inventor of the patent application. Okay, so that there's a stipulation there, right? They have to have at least, did you call it one claim? Yeah, at least one claim that, yeah. To be a part of that particular patent. That's correct, yes. You know, I have a question sort of related to that, you know, and, and I don't know if you alluded to this earlier, but on average, it's mm -hmm. going to differ from patent to patent. But what would be um, a reasonable time frame in terms of start to finish, right? Start the mm -hmm. process, have the idea and take it all the way and see it through to the finish mm -hmm. line um, to, to actually have that patent, um, you know, secured in your name. How long is that process? Can you give people an expectation? 
Yeah, only because I've been doing this for more than 10 years uh, for myself, as soon as I identify the challenge and then I do spend several hours to do per hour search just to make sure that my idea is novel before writing up. And uh, in terms of, you know, writing up the Discord document and create flowchart or user interface mockup, and that will only take me a few hours as well. And uh, by the time when we file the patent application, we do have to work with the patent attorneys closely to make sure they understand our inventions and to make sure their uh, official document covers all the possible claims we have in our invention. And uh, we want to make sure all the technical terms, the drawings you know, of um, the flowchart are accurate. So that will take some time as well. But um, again, only because I've been doing that for more than 10 years, it's a relatively you know, fast uh, process for me. Yeah, because you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, so um, you know, I, have, I have so many questions. Does that, if anyone else from the audience has questions, please use the Ask a Question feature. Uh, we still have some time um, to, to address those with Florence. And so you, know, you talked about making sure you do your due diligence and your research after you get an idea before you actually go to the drawing board, right? Yeah. Have you ever encountered, and, and I'm sure the answer is yes, but maybe you can tell us about a particular example where you thought you had this great idea and then you did your research and it turned out it already existed? Oh, that happens to me uh, frequently. Yeah. And even though, you know, I have filed more than 100, I mean, 190 patents applications already, that can happen to me on a monthly basis. Yeah. And it was really interesting that several uh, years ago, uh, I think that was a very sunny summer. I mean, summer day, and uh, I was waiting at the traffic light just to, you know, wait for the traffic light to turn from red to green. And mm -hmm. the sun glare was so strong, and I could not see the signal. At that moment, I thought about that uh, I should really create a new invention to be able to transmit the signal to my dashboard. This way, I don't have to look at the traffic light itself because I was not even able to see it. By the time when I got home, I was so excited. I just started to search. And then somebody actually um, already uh, talked about the same um, solution in their blog. And as a result, I was not able to file a patent on that. Uh, but I think, uh, and, and you said that happens like monthly for you, but yeah. I think it's important to, to note, and if, if mm -hmm. I can say so, is yeah. it, you don't let it discourage you. You know what I mean? Like, okay, so somebody else created it, but I had a great idea and, and you just go back to the drawing board and think of something new, right? Yeah, exactly. So over the years, as you can see, I started uh, patenting in the email calendar and the instant messaging application field to start with more than 10 years ago. And then when Twitter and Facebook came out, I switched my patenting focus to social software. And then I switched to a different organization in IBM where I focus on healthcare analytics, where I was able to file lots of patents in healthcare and IoT. And along the way, I learned a lot about security and the blockchain. Even though I don't work in the blockchain domain for my day job, I was able to take the online courses to learn more about blockchain. And I was able to file two patents in that domain. <clears throat> so that's, a, um, that's an amazing point that you brought up. So you were you started working in you know one particular area or vein, and then you were able to pivot and, mm -hmm. and refocus sort of where your thinking was um, because mm -hmm. of the um, you know the the rise of social media. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, um, you learned new things. You learned about blockchain mm -hmm. and things that you already mm -hmm. weren't involved in. And so uh, yeah. the, the creativity or the inspiration to create patents or invent um, could lead you down different roads where you um, mm -hmm. discover new things and, and learn new things. That's great. Yeah, yeah it's really fun. You know, I have a, uh, another question um, in terms of, and for the audience out there, this is quite amazing. So me and Florence, you know, we've been working on this session for a couple of weeks and getting planning going and stuff. And um, when we started, she sent me her bio and it said um, she's developed uh, over 180 patents. And so, so that's amazing in and of itself. And then we were just practicing before we went live today and um, I read the bio and she said, well, you need to update it because uh, it's now over 190. Um, and that happened in two weeks time. I mean, 10 more patents. And so my question is, is there a um, sort of a, a cue 
where things are in the pike or, you know, they're, they're like almost near the approval process, but they're still waiting for some, like how did 10 flood in, in, in two weeks time? Were they just sort of, you know, almost there ready, waiting for approval? How does that go? Yeah, so basically that uh, once we file the patent applications to USPTO, they don't appear in the USPTO database immediately. Actually, um, we have to wait for 18 months before they are officially searchable in the USPTO database. I just happened to see that like yesterday that I got another 10 more that are searchable within the USPTO website. I think it depends on when they get officially published to, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and that happens like it happened in bulk, like all 10 at once. It could happen like that. Yeah. That's okay. Correct. Yeah. Very good. So um, let's see. I don't see any other questions here. I think um, I think what we'll do is we'll end the session. Um, there is information that people are asking for, Florence, before I take mm -hmm. us out. And I'll just make, make that known now. So the, the recording um, for mm -hmm. this particular Virtual track session is going to be made available um, in the coming days. So yep. anyone who wants to rewatch it or share it, we'll, we'll send you that link. Um, Florence, your slides as well, um, they, they can be shared, right? Because people yes. are asking for the presentation. So we'll get you the slide deck um, yes. from today's presentation. Um, and then with that, what I'll do is I'll just sort of take us out. I do want to, again, Florence, thank you so much for being here. Your work is amazing. It's very inspiring. And I'm just glad that you were able to be a part of our virtual track uh, for the WE ILC conference. So thank you very much. Um, I do want to invite everyone next week to come back on April 25th. So that's a week from today, Thursday, April 25th. Uh, we do have a speaker. Her name is uh, Lavesha Parker. She is from Etsy. Everyone knows the company Etsy. And the name of her session is Tech Leading Through the Unknown Resiliency and Keeping the House Standing. And she is gonna discuss three fail-safe ways that she's developed to have measures and processes in place to keep the house standing, even when extenuating circumstances give you every reason to have things slip through the cracks. So if you're in um, that world and you're leading through technology and you know, you, you've run into roadblocks or red tape, join next week's session. Lavesha from Etsy is really gonna go over um, some great information that I think um, you know, everyone can learn from. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll say thank you again to our speaker, Florence Liu from IBM. I'll thank everyone out in the audience for joining today. Really appreciate it. And have a great rest of your day, everybody. Take care thank now. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.